Hello, welcome everyone, welcome back. This is the second part of my little starting series of the unpacking of the setup of the 76 EDPH refractor I recently bought. And yeah, this is video number two. And as you see, um, today we are out to do the first light with it. And I want, I want to invite you to join me on this evening, on this night. Um, yeah, with the telescope I will set up in a few minutes and to do some photos. Because of the small focal length of 340 millimeters, I will go for large nebulas. But as you may know, in May, you have May 2020, there are not so many gas nebulas in the over the meridian, but they will start rising. Signals will rise over there about 11 p.m. And that would be really great. I will go for the Elephant Strength Nebula, also known as IC1396. Um, this is a really interesting H-alpha structure in a large nebula. I can't cover the whole nebula with this uh, focal length, but I will do a properly framed uh, part of the nebula. So there are still at least two hours until it's dark. So I have plenty of time to set up the equipment, do a polar alignment as soon as Polaris came out. And then I will talk you through my images, what I am doing, what's the setup all about. Um, yeah, but it's not, not really entry level. So if you want more information about how to start or something like that, then drop me a comment or something um, or a message. Um, I can cover this too, but this video here is more or less all about the first light of a dedicated um, astronomical telescope. So um, I hope you're fine with that. Before setting all up, uh, there's something more to tell you. For me, um, as a remote observer, that means I control a observatory remote. It's uh, very rare that I'm out, that I do mobile astrophotography. So I, yeah, I hope I have everything packed up, every cable adapter, whatever. Um, most of the time I forgot something, counterweights, for example. Um, but I found this wonderful field here. It was born, uh, I think, some days ago. Absolutely fantastic. I have complete 360 degree view when I move my car out of the way so I can catch uh, Cygnus and Kifius um, right there uh, as soon as it's dark enough so absolutely fantastic but uh, there in the, in the western horizon there are clouds coming so I don't know if it's really working tonight I hope I can catch at least one hour of data that would be fine to get a proper image out of it. Um, maybe I can catch up some some uh, holes in the, in the between the clouds. But anyway, it's a fantastic warm, yeah, 15 degrees Celsius warm evening here in Germany. Fantastic, fantastic location also. Okay, folks. Before it's getting too dark. I want to show you my equipment I use here a bit more in detail. So where to start? I think here, this one. This is the already mentioned Skywatcher AZ EQ5. It's basically a combination of an azimuthal mount and an equatorial mount. Azimuthal then you can, oops, um, turn the right ascension block horizontal, which is quite cool if you need it, if you want to have two setups only visual observing, something like that. Of course, I use it in equatorial mode, so it's roughly aligned to Polaris. And yeah, it's a, a relatively new mount. The EQ5 family is quite old, but this is the newest children of this family and it's really, really nice. And it's 
uh, also has encoders in both axes, so you can freely mount. That is also what Freedom Find means. Uh, you can move the telescope by hand and it still knows the position in the sky, if it's correctly aligned. This is really cool. I really wanted this, but at the moment these encoders make me a bit of headache because they are flipping some way, uh, but I did not uh, solve this problem yet. So, and a bit higher. Here's the telescope. If you have not seen my first video on this telescope, I would suggest to to give, um, yeah, just to check out the links in the description and also my channel and you find it. Uh, this is dimensioned 76 EDPH from, from TS. Um, this is a dew heater. It's mounted on the dew shield. It's basically only a heat band, which is uh, powered by 12 volt power supply. And the camera, the ASI294MC, is already connected here. This is the main camera, 11 megapixel OSC camera. That means I can take a color image in one shot. It's highly responsive, 85% quantum efficiency, but also a bit or oh, really noisy and and the corrector is also already in place with the uh, Optolong L Pro filter here in this one. What we have here is this old crappy guide scope 8x50 connected with an or equipped with an ZWO ASI120 Mini as a guide camera. Uh, you will see this in action in a few minutes, I hope. And what we have on the top here, I Normally I do not need this, but I just want it complete. It's a Bader Sky Server. It's some sort of finder scope, uh, but it has no magnification. It's just a red dot finder, like basically like the Telrad. Um, this is equipped here on this on this handle. Yeah, that's that's basically all of it. Um, the laptop. Handpad of the mount, of course. This is a 12 volt to 220, 230 volt adapter for the for the laptop. Below here is the battery, and what I also brought with me is this little piece of gear. This is a Batinov mask. This is some kind of interference mask, which is uh, used to achieve proper focus. It's a really nice invention, made by a Russian guy obviously called Padinov, and this is placed in front of the telescope, in front of the lens, and it will generate a really unique diffraction pattern, which you can easily recognize and you can easily uh, see if the image is in or out of focus. And yeah, I just printed it today on my 3D printer, only a piece of plastic, nothing special to it. Um, until I have auto focusing, that means electronic focusing on the scope, this is a good way to go. With modern cameras like this, uh, you can also do it live in a sort of live view. Um, this is absolutely fine to to do it on the on the image of the star, but this uh, mask is more more precise. Until it's getting real dark, I did some test shots, so maybe this is the first light. I'm sorry, um, but you always have to test your equipment. I set up everything. That means I polar aligned it with the help of PhD guiding. This is the software here. And this software has a util to do the drift alignment. This is a sort of shiner alignment you may know from visual observing or from the past. Um, but with the help of a CCD camera or a CMOS camera in my case, um, this is going really fast. I can or I have polar aligned this setup within, I think, five or six minutes. 
uh, at least good enough for this short focal length. Um, you see the guiding graph here that shows the error of the guiding. That means also the corrections that the guider made to the mount. We are measure arc seconds here. One, two, three, four is the maximum. That means plus minus four arc seconds. So now the point is the resolution of the of the system is um, I think something around two arc seconds. That means everything in this range, as you can see here, is absolutely no problem. You can't see this arrow in the image. So we are absolutely fine. Guiding is working really well. And what we also have is my sky shots program, Cards du Ciel. And at the moment we are pointing at M13, the great cluster in Hercules, one of the biggest and brightest globular clusters in the night sky. It's always a some sort of standard candle. Um, but it's yeah, it's not the target I want to shoot tonight, but just that you have an impression how this will look. This is the full field of the ASI294 camera, what you can see here. And right in the middle, point on is M13, Messier 13. And when we zoom in, you can see the fantastic structure of this object. Unfortunately, Sequence Generator Pro, the software I use here for imaging, does not debayer. That means you see the, the raw black and white image from this OSC sensor. So it looks a bit weird, but uh, in the post-processing, we go to debayer it and make color image out of it. This is a 120 second exposure now. Uh, I am just uh, set up the whole thing with uh, zero gain, by the way, uh, just to mention if someone is interested in, I want a maximum dynamic range out of the camera because it is real bright. There are real bright objects in this, in this uh, cluster. Uh, two minute exposure, one by one binning, of course, and 20 repeats for the moment. So, yeah, <clears throat> nothing special about it, honestly. It's just to uh, came over the, the time when it's not real dark. It's 20 past 10 in the moment. I think in 20 or 30 minutes it's dark enough to switch to a different target. This is just to overcome the time now at the moment. And then, when the time has come, I just want to zoom in a bit. So at the moment we are here, in the middle of the Hercules uh, constellation. And then we are moving down here, Cepheus. On the edge of the Milky Way, there is IC1396, the elephant trunk. That's the target I want to shoot. And this is absolutely fine. I really love it. I really love to be out here in the in the darkness on this field. It's fantastic, fantastic feeling. And also the images work at for the moment the images look really pretty. Pinpoint stars. Um, of course we have undersampling, a lot of undersampling, but if you want to know some technical details, I do dithering every frame. That means every frame is, whoops, what's happened here? I don't know, something going on now. No clouds, I can't tell you what this is. Okay, but back to dithering. Um, I, the system shifts every frame by a minimum a minimal amount of pixels and if when you have enough frames 20 is not enough but let's say 60 70 80 frames something like that then you can increase the resolution um, it's a yeah it's called a 
super sampling or upsampling and for astronomical images this work really well you can't double the resolution or something like that but you can increase it you can get more details out of it and dithering has some other advantages like noise reduction and yeah basically that's it but something happens now something going on here the, the guiding does not look so promising at the moment so i will have to check out what's going on here and i get you back when the time has come for the right object so bye for now Oh, what a long, long night. It's now 10 past one in the morning and I was able to catch more than 30 frames of the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. The guiding now works absolutely well. And just let me show you sequence generator. Um, yeah, we have 32 frames now. Unfortunately, here in the preview, you just can't see anything what's going on here. This is the full field. And this is, I think, Mu Seifi is this star called. And here is the whole the whole nebula here is the, the trunk but you can barely make out here in the in the processed image this would be look really nice yeah still exactly on target So back to the guiding. This is really nice. See here some some peaks from the dithering. I or still did every frame. Um, I hope this will improve the the final quality. Uh, yeah, we can can show it to you at 100%. This is the 100% view. Oh, I did not mention it. I do four minute exposures. It is maybe a bit long, a bit too long, especially because the stars are saturated, as I said. Let's have a look in the corners. Yeah, the. Oh, there was one finished. It's a bit oblong in the left upper edge. This one here is. Absolute circular, perfect. Lower right, also perfect. And lower left, yeah, I think that's okay. Hope that I can go to the bed soon. Uh, but anyway, I think this is what astrophotography is also all about. Um, to be out in such a wonderful night and looking at the night sky that's absolutely fantastic and it's yeah it touches my mind in some way always also after yeah more than 20 years of astronomy as a hobby it's still a fantastic moment to be out under the stars so anyway guys uh, thank you very much for joining you in this wonderful evening. I will show you in a few seconds the final image of the evening. And so thanks again. And if you like it, uh, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Uh, I would highly appreciate it. Thank you guys and bye bye.